A question we're frequently asked on VetSource is, where can I find a doctor who, you know, uses this way of treating people? Preventive doctor. You know, where in my neighborhood can I find somebody who uses a plant-based diet and isn't just going to prescribe me a bunch of pills I don't really need? One person who always pops to mind is our next speaker, Dr. Don Forrester. Don retired for after 35 years at Kaiser as a family medicine physician. He, um, in the last few years of his practice, uh, began applying this information to his patients. And so he had, let's say, I think, 120 type 2 diabetes patients. He offered them all the information to use diet to get off medication and to basically cure themselves. And I think it was like 20 of them decided to try it. And as it would have, their medication went down. They got off all medication, and he took them out of the diabetic roles. These people are no, no longer diabetic. Well, at Kaiser, they've got incentives to help uh, bring the amount of medi medications your patients get down. And if your patients as a group go down, let's say, 30% in the amount of medication because they're taking your advice and being healthier, you get money. You get a bonus. At the end of the year, whoa, you reduced patients by 30%. So... Pretty good, huh? This guy's actually curing people, but that's a problem. You see, Kaiser is not set up to deal with patients who are cured of type 2 diabetes and taken out, because when you take out the patients who change their diet and are no longer diabetic, then the people that are left over who didn't change their diet, their medication didn't go down that much, so you don't look on paper like you're doing a very good job. And in fact, I think it cost Don maybe $1,000 well, whatever, <laughs> of a bonus, because when they came in and they said, Don, your numbers aren't that good. He said, well, I took 22 people off the type 2 roll because they're no longer diabetic. They looked at him. You shouldn't have done that. But Don, even if it costs him money, he gets people well. So Don works with PCRM, uh, Physicians Kitty, Committee for Responsible Medicine. He is an expert, as I say, in, yeah preventing and reversing chronic disease. He is the medical director of Meals for Health. We couldn't do the program without him. Um, he, uh, you know, has been in both of the pilot programs that we've done. And I would just ask the Progressive Missionary Baptist Church people who are here, who had Don as their physician for the month that we did the program and ongoing checking. And what do you guys think of Dr. Forrester back there? Yeah, there you go. There's some of his satisfied patients. Um, he's an amazing guy. He's a talented healer because he shows you how to heal yourself. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Don Forrester. Thanks, Jeff. It's a real honor to, uh, and a privilege to be part of this great event uh, and to address you. Uh, the story that Jeff told is, you know, there's always devils in the detail. Uh, it didn't cost me that much money, uh, and uh, I actually appealed the decision, but because I was leaving that year and retiring, I really didn't care what the outcome was. Uh, so today, uh, what I'd like to do, today I'd like to uh, do two objectives. One, tell you a little bit about the Meals for Health program, and two, allow you to get some information on a personal level that might help you avoid uh, chronic disease and disability. I was trained as a chemical engineer, so I learned at an early age, at least when I was in college, to uh, solve problems with science and numbers. I then uh, learned my trait or my craft of medicine at Georgetown, Georgetown University Medical School and did a family medicine residency out in Sacramento, California and decided to stay at that point. I didn't miss the heat, humidity, gnats, or thunderstorms of my native Washington, D.C. area and went to work for Kaiser Permanente and very shortly got involved in some leadership programs. Uh, I was very privileged over those 30 years that I worked with Kaiser to, I think I calculated when I took early retirement that I'd seen over 250,000 individual patient visits, so I had the opportunity and the privilege to go in and shake people's hands and try and make them better. It was only in my last three years of being there that I actually started applying the nutritional things that I'm going to share with you today. And along the way, I also had the opportunity to become a leader as a, in a preventive medicine clinic for five years, run a family medicine department with 36 physicians, open and run a multi-specialty clinic with 65 physicians and two outpatient ORs for 10 years. 
and along the way became a certified physician executive with 1,500 hours of management training, passed those boards, and I'm also a proud graduate of Brent James uh, Advanced Training Program in Intermountain, which is probably the best program in the country for quality improvement and how you eliminate errors is total quality management, for those of you who are familiar with the term. And in the last three years, I was at Kaiser and curing diabetics, my physicians, uh, fellow physicians asked me to start giving them talks on chronic disease, and one thing led to another, and now I give talks, uh, what I do now in my sort of retirement, although my wife has assured me I'm working as hard as when I, before I retire, just not making as much money. I'm involved, I'm involved with projects, I do some writing, uh, publishing in the physician executive journals, and I get involved with projects, but more importantly, I am a physician, and it's what I enjoy doing the most. I have a uh, boutique practice up in Folsom where I see patients, sort of an unusual practice. I'm also on staff with John McDougall, I just finished yesterday seeing 15 Whole Foods employees who had gone through the McDougal Whole Foods employee and they got all better. Uh, we'll tell you a little bit about that. So, and then I get to wear the hat of medical director for Meals for Health, which is sort of, sort of how I got here today. So the presentation comes in three parts. I'm going to give you a framework so you'll have some terms and understand some concepts so you'll be able to apply those as we go through the talk, talk about Meals for Health, and then we're going to wrap it up. So let's talk about the framework. We've got a problem in this country. It's called premature death. It's not that we're, it's not, you know, it's, we're all going to die. It's just like we push it off a ways, okay? So if I'm going to die of cardiovascular disease, I'd much rather have it sudden death in my sleep at 102 than sudden death at 70. Uh, but we talk about this, and, and most of the, you know, seven of the things that are highlighted are all related to what we eat. Uh, we'll come back to this a little later in the talk. But we need to also talk about disability because it's also about quality of life. 22% of the adults in this country are disabled at this particular point. That's 50 million people. And everything on this list is connected to what you eat. So the definitions we have to get straight are the difference between primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. Primary prevention is you do not have a disease and you do something so you don't get it. So you have normal sugars and you do things so you keep having normal sugars and you don't get diabetes or prediabetes. Secondary prevention is you have diabetes, you may or may not be on medication, you do something so you are normal, your sugars are normal, and you're on no medication. Tertiary prevention is where you've got a disease and we've got you taking pills or procedures and you've still got the disease. So medicine has an opportunity to go in which direction and you can imagine which direction they went in, okay? So here's to ask your doctor if playing into the hands of the pharmaceutical industry is right for you. So people like me who's a medicine, all they do minor procedures like toenails and lance boils and stuff like that. I'm not a surgeon, so uh, I push prescriptions and pills, and we've done a good job at that. Less than 21, over 25% of people under age 21 are on one medication or more, and by age 65, we've got that 25% number. We've got five or more medications on average, such that about over half the people in this country are on one medication. And this is 2007 data. It's not current data. It's gotten worse since then. So clearly the medicine docs like me have done our job going off into tertiary prevention. But so have the uh, surgeons, by the way. Welcome to Texas. Come for the barbecue. Stay for the angioplasty. Uh, in 2007, uh, angioplasty and bypass, we did 1.8 million procedures, spent over $100 billion, and killed 27,000 people in the first month. Now, John Glenn, who died of a complication of, of bypass surgery, died after three months. Those people aren't in these numbers. The surgeons include mortality within the month after procedures. They don't track it out after that. So the number, this is probably a conservative number. And the interesting thing is, as, and I'm not going to get into arterial disease too much because you've got probably the country's leading and probably the world's leading expert, Dr. Esselstyn, is going to talk to you tomorrow. So I'm not going to get into that. Uh, he's going to, we'll talk a little bit about it, but we'll leave the rest to uh, Dr. Esselstyn. Concept I want to talk to you about today is a system. Systems are a set of things, people, cells, molecules, whatever. They're interconnected in such a way they produce their own pattern of behavior over time. We are surrounded by systems all the time. And there's sort of two systems for you to keep in mind. One is a static system, which is complicated, predictable, and stable. It's like a chemical reaction. Like when I was a chemical engineer, we'd do things in the lab and stuff like that. Very predictable. Put in certain changes, you get the same results every time. Car manufacturing, assembly lines. When I was growing up, 
when I was young, uh, made in Japan meant junk. That was in the 50s. It doesn't mean junk anymore, for those of you who know that. And that was because Dr. Deming taught the Japanese after World War II about quality improvement. Life would be really simple if we were just surrounded by static systems. However, we are surrounded by adaptive systems. And these are complex, unpredictable, and dynamic. Examples of this would be human metabolism, all the different things going on in your body at a given time. Humans are complex systems. Teams of doctors and nurses are complex systems. Organizations are complex systems. The nice thing about complex systems is you can get really dramatic results if you do the right things in the right way. So here's our uh, friend Archimedes, who famously said, given a spot and the right lever, he will move the world. If you use people and technology and you apply the best science and you do it correctly in the correct innovative ways, we can move this uh, world called chronic disease and eliminate it. Looking for different levers, though, and we use these things all the time. I use them when I'm working with patients. I provide information. We'll tell some stories. You'll hear some patient clips today. Relationships are important. I use that with our patients. You use it with your spouse and your family to get them to change things. Feedback is important. You get lab tests and see how you're doing. You measure how much you're running and how fast you go. Setting goals is important. We work with patients to what, what would you like to accomplish? What are your goals? And your beliefs. And they're more effective as we go down this list. So we're going to talk a little bit. I don't have enough time today with my CME talks for my, that I do for physicians. And the talks I do, I also give talks uh, to leadership groups and medical organizations to try and bridge the chasm between the administrators and the physicians. They seem to be working, uh, trying to do sort of the same thing, but coming at it from different angles. So I can sort of speak to both groups at the same time. I like to try and do that. But as we go through, I want you to think about these things, and I want you to think about your own goals for your own health and see what you might pick up from the talk that might make it useful for you once the talk's over. There's a caution, however. You can get unanticipated outcomes if you're not careful. And we're surrounded all the time. Uh, the government may do something, and then all of a sudden something happens that they don't anticipate. Well, Operation Cat Drop is a good example of this. 1950, there was an outbreak of malaria in Borneo, which led the World Health Organization to fund a drop of DDT. Kill the mosquitoes. Eliminate the malaria, right? And it worked. They did eliminate the malaria. It got a lot less. But then the roofs, the thatch roofs, started collapsing on the uh, natives. What had happened is the thatch-eating caterpillars had started growing out of control and eating their roofs. Well, the government fixed that. They came in and gave them 10 roofs. Of course, sleeping in under 10 roofs in the tropics when it's raining makes it a little difficult. It's sort of like sleeping inside a snare drum. What had happened was the DDT, while it was killing off the mosquitoes, had also killed off the thatch-eating wasps. I mean, the uh, parasitic wasps that controlled the thatch-eating caterpillars. Well, in the meantime, while that was going on, the geckos were eating both the thatch-eating caterpillars and the parasitic wasps, and their DDTs were going up. The cats were eating the geckos. They were dying from DDT, and because the cats were dying, there was a rat infestation. So then they were worried about an outbreak of sylvanic plague and typhus, so they had the Royal Air Force parachute in 14,000 cats. Okay. We're surrounded by these things all the time. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about Meals for Health. Now that you have the framework and the background, some definitions and concepts, let's talk a little bit about the background for Meals for Health. <clears throat> John and Mary McDougall. Uh, for those of you who know them, uh, John was practicing internist in uh, Hawaii and got asked by St. Helena Hospital to come over and set up a 12-day inpatient program for the uh, for a nutritional program. And he did that for about 16 years. And then he moved to Santa Rosa, moved the program to Santa Rosa at the Flamingo, where it has been since then. And it involved, he, he, he skinnied it down to 10 days. For, for those of you who are familiar with the McDougal 10-day program, that's sort of the history of it. And then uh, he, would, he was asked to be on the Whole Foods Advisory, Scientific Advisory Committee. And we'll talk about Whole Foods in a minute. But that led to the McDougal Whole Foods program that I'm proud and honored to be part of twice a year. 
And what the Whole Foods McDougal program basically was, it's an eight-day program because the way it's designed is Whole Food team members apply and Whole Foods pays for them to go through the eight-day program plus pays their transportation to and from the program. All they have to do is take a, a week's vacation. It's a starch-centered, plant-based diet. It's not a tough gig, actually, if you take a vacation at the Flamingo Resort, you know, where you live and get 33 hours of lectures and exercise groups, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, buffets, all you can eat, snack room opens 24 hours a day. Uh, you get to interact with other team members. I've actually seen Whole Foods team members in Santa Rosa from Scotland and England and, and Canada and all, just about all over the United States. And we get to provide medical care as part of this. We do intake physicals and then sort of go away and patients get monitored. And I see them six days later and they're all better. It's amazing work if you can get it. And Whole Foods did this for two reasons. They were very interested in their team member health, but they're also trying to control their medical costs. You may be associated with some organizations that are worried about the cost of their medical care for their, in their benefits package. Well, Whole Foods was actually experiencing what most corporations were experiencing up to 2006 of increases between 10 and 17 percent in their medical expenses. In 2006, they put in a health savings account. And that decreased their amount of uptake as far as their rates were going up into about the 9, 10% range. And then in 2009, they did two things. The first was they implemented a McDougal immersion program both in Santa Rosa and Austin, which is the Esselstyn program, and Furman and Stoll run programs back east. So there are four immersion programs around the country. The other thing they did was introduce biometric testing. So as you as a Whole Food employee, team member, you get 20% off when you buy stuff in the store. But based on your, your weight, your blood pressure, your cholesterol, you're fasting sugar, and as long as you're a non-smoker, you can work up to the bronze, silver, gold, and platinum level. Each one of those steps gets you 2.5% off, so you can work up to 30% off. So not only is Whole Foods investing in their employees in a one-time way with the immersion program, and they actually pay 50% for spouses of Whole, team, of Whole Food team members. They're committed, that committed. They also give feedback on a regular basis every time these people go and shop. So they... If, if they had not done those programs in 2009, and I want, I want to give courtesy to John Mackey and his Whole Foods team for sharing data with me so I can put this slide up. Uh, if you had taken their projected increase to 2009 out to 2012, they're probably about $117 million to the good. Of course, it's always hard to know how much you're talking, you know, because you're making projections and assumptions, but as an engineer, I can do that. I'm not much of a finance guy, but uh, I can at least do some pencil and paper calculations. So let's hear from Ben. I hear I type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, really high cholesterol, um, was on two different diabetes medications, Lipitor for my cholesterol and Lisinopril for high blood pressure. I lost a couple pounds while I was here. And in the last like seven months or so since, I've lost about 62 pounds. Completely reverse the diabetes. My waking blood sugars are generally around 75, 80 every day. I stopped taking measurements after three months of those readings. Um, my life's completely changed. I have tons of energy. I feel fantastic. I can finally beat my six-year-old in a race, which <laughs> is a nice thing. Uh, ben was one of the first patients I saw at Whole Foods. He's now one of their star stars that goes around and talks about this stuff. His acid reflux also disappeared. He was fairly successful at losing weight. He lost weight at about two pounds per week, but he was a, he was also a gym rat, so he was doing a lot of exercise at the same time. Uh, he also so this is an example of curing chronic disease, sort of a, a shift because a lot of physicians and patients don't believe that you can do this. Uh, one of the tools that I find especially helpful, and, and you can use, uh, it requires just a little bit of explanation. This comes from my uh, statistical process control work and some uh, work done by Larry Staker at uh, Intermountain Healthcare in Salt Lake. Uh, this is a run chart. A run chart is basically data over time. You know, the American Diabetic Association will say, well, bring your numbers to your doctors, and they always come in in these booklets. It's a terrible way to understand data. Even tables don't work too well. Run charts are much more effective. So here's the run chart I use with my patients. On the left axis, uh, the y-axis, you can see 
from 60 to 90, 190. So when patients check their blood pressure or their sugars in the morning, they can record those values every day and they see how it is over time. You can also use this by putting weights on the right axis, but since everybody's weight goals are different, I can't come up with a standard form, so I just do that, individualize that when I see patients. This is called a run chart. You can turn it into a specification chart by putting lines on it. So you can put a line at 125 and tell patients, just follow your sugars until you get below 125, and then you're no longer diabetic. And when you get below 100, then you're no longer pre-diabetic. So when Larry Staker uh, took his practice of diabetics and just had them do this, their hemoglobin A1Cs, their control improved by half a point with no other intervention. Just giving patients a good way to get feedback loops. Remember we talked about feedback loops as lever of change is very useful. So this is a tool that might be useful for you. Uh, the best science in diabetes, everybody knows it's a sugar processing problem. We'll get to sugar in a minute. But it's the fats in the diet that cause the problem. The fats get into the blood and interfere with the insulin so it can't throw the glucose into the cell. Further than that, it gets the fats get into the cell and turn off the genes that run the mitochondria that burn the sugar. So it's the fats in the diet that cause the sugar processing problem. Rosati in the, in the 40s at Duke University, the rice diet, which has been going on since then, they were curing type 2 diabetics with rice, basically rice diet. You can put type 2 diabetics on potatoes and they get better. All this carbophobia has gotten a little bit out of hand. But to help sort of clear this up a little bit, let's talk about sugar for a minute, carbohydrates. Simple sugars, the most common ones you're so, you hear about are glucose and fructose. Table sugar you're also familiar with, that's one molecule of each, glucose and fructose. Glucose is your primary fuel. It suppresses your appetite. It has a sweetness factor of 73, and it's your body's primary fuel. It's fabulous for you. Fructose, on the other hand, which is a very similar molecule, is treated entirely different by the body. The body almost treats it like a poison. It's only metabolized by the liver. And it's metabolized to uric acid, which gives you a tendency towards gout. It also messes up your nitrous oxide system, so it tends to raise your blood pressure. It's, it, it makes triglycerides, which are fats, that in, then interfere with the diabetes, even though it's a low glycemic food, because it doesn't, it doesn't actually uh, increase your glucose at all. It makes cholesterol, triglycerides. So it, and it's got a sweetness factor of 173, and it does not suppress your appetite. So here's a dream food for the food processing industry. Doesn't suppress your appetite, and it's very sweet. Okay, So it has to be used with caution. And sometimes when I had a Whole Foods employee who I took care of, and you're used to seeing them for their intake, and all their numbers are better, and they're feeling fine. The only trouble with this particular gentleman is his triglycerides had gone from 200 to 500. I sort of knew what he was doing, but I asked him anyway. He says, oh, I've been eating fruit. I've been eating fruit all over the place. You know, I'm a fruit fruitaholic. So we had to cut him back a little bit on his fruit. So, so now you understand simple sugars. Let's look at complex carbohydrates, which are basically just long chains of uh, glucose molecules. This stuff is really good for you. And John McDougall wrote a book called The Starch Solution, where he talks about this in depth, uh, basically calls the starchivores. Our ad adaptation from the great apes is we have two to three times the amylase genes, which produce amylase, which is the enzyme that actually breaks the bonds of these glucose. The amylase is in your saliva, and it's in your pancreatic juices that hit your intestine. So, we are adapted to digest starches. And beyond that, that's Nathaniel Dominey's work out of Dartmouth. Catherine Milton's work out of Berkeley has shown that we have a 40% more volume in our small intestine compared to the great apes. So we're actually designed to absorb this. So we're basically starchivores. So now you understand how you can cure diabetes. Let's talk about a remarkable study. When I started giving CME talks to docs, I started looking at the literature. And this is 2006. And this is a very interesting study that was done up in the Weimar Clinic. It's an Adventist clinic. And basically, they took 21 patients who had had diabetes for 12 years and painful distal neuropathy for three and a half years. And they put them on a low-fat, plant-based diet, exercise 30 minutes a day. 17 of the 21 had complete relief of their neuropathy within 16 days. These were patients that I was regularly pushing Elevil and Tegretol on to control their symptoms, but didn't have this information. And I thought to myself, I've been working, you know, why didn't I know about this study? Well, it's buried in this mass of literature out there. 
But as you noticed, because we did, they did a good approach, they also got weight loss, decreased triglycerides, cholesterol, and they also got 80% of them off their blood pressure medicine. And 71% were following it, the diet in about four years. Beyond reversing the complication of neuropathy, here's a publication that courtesy uh, John McDougall, let me use his slide, of 1958 that showed a gentleman who had type 2 diabetes and, and went on a, the proper diet for 26 months. In this case, it was a rice diet. And actually, it's hard for you to see, but in this, uh, on the left photograph there, you see a lot of damage in the retina. In the right photograph, you see much improvement. So it actually reversed the retinopathy in a little over two years. Amazing. So shifting our beliefs, here's a guy who's not quite informed, looking at a doctor who's probably also not quite informed. Diabetes has increased dramatically over the past 20 years. That proves that diabetes is caused by global warming. Well, you now know the best science about diabetes. You know, cure is possible, complications can improve. The only, the only thing I would caution you on is, if you're on blood pressure medicine or diabetes, and you go on the right diet, you can actually get low sugars and low pressures. So you need to work with your docs, your nurse practitioners around this. And it's always better to do this earlier. It's always better to do it before you get the diabetes or before you get the complications. So let's talk about Mills for Health for Sacramento because Sabrina Nelson, who, uh, as you may have heard, uh, had good results from the di uh, McDougall approach, came up with the idea of having an outpatient McDougall program. So what we did uh, for the first program is we designed a 30-day program that had a kickoff weekend where they got really intensive education over the weekend and then followed up by twice-weekly events over a month. Uh, we gave them uh, food for a month, and uh, they were divided up into participants and observers. The participants got clinical care from me. The observers just went through the educational program. And, and four or five uh, of the participants had one food coach each, and then I provided clinical care for the month. We brought in quality speakers. You probably recognize some of these excellent people. Uh, Rip Esselstyn, uh, Pam Popper, the McDougals again, they keep popping up. Jeff Novick down the left lower, best registered dietitian in the country, and Doug Lyle, the psychologist. Uh, I have the uh, pleasure of working with both of them up at the McDougal Clinic. And we basically learned, and we ate, and we worked. Here's pictures of uh, one of the food coaches on the left with her four people, and, and the kids even get involved. And on the right, you see a couple volunteers working uh, to st stuff the food into the boxes for the weekly pickup, and the one on the closest to you is one of the food coaches as well. And then there's the room where we met Support's important. This is a graduation picture uh, of everybody who's participating in the program up in Sacramento. Uh, and the results are impressive. 17-pound uh, weight loss after two months, 27 points down in cholesterol, blood pressure down, over 80% less medicine, saving $4,400 a year, down on supplements, increased energy. And here again, the numbers are important, but I think it's important if we hear from some of the participants. So here's Ollie. I started having high blood pressure when I was in my 40s. And uh, since then, it was always high, but as I've gotten older, it was getting higher. And so my doctors were monitoring me, and I had been on that blood pressure medicine for over 22 years. This program done something for me that the medical industry couldn't do for me. This program done something for me in four days. Four days, I was off of my blood pressure medicine. You know. Um, when I started it, and four days, uh, we started April the 8th. April the 12th was my doctor's appointment, and I went in there, and uh, she took my blood pressure, because it had been running like 160 over 104, and it was going up, and they had upped my medication. And then when I started this vegan program, it went down, it was 123 over 78. Woo! And uh, she says, uh, oh, I think that the medicine that the doctor gave you is working. I go like, no, <laughs> it, it's, 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 it's the food. And it really was the food, you know? I mean, I've been searching for a long time. I spent a lot of money at the health stores. I really did, uh, trying to find out what was good for me. Uh, I hadn't had pork in like 38 years, but I was still eating chicken and turkey and fish. And uh, I, I wasn't doing too well. I was spending all this money on noni juice. I was spending the money on spirulina, uh, my calcium, pills, all this money I was spending, and all I needed to know was that I needed to eat this plant-based strong, 
density, low light. It was just so simple. And I'm going like, wow, I, I didn't have that, that one puzzle that was missing. And this, this is it, you know. I don't see myself going back to ever eating the way that I was eating because of the fact that I'm medicine free right now. And I'm loving it. <laughs> I'm loving it. I don't, I, I, I get up in the mornings and I could just leave my house. I don't have to worry about, oh, did I take that blood pressure medicine? No, I, I'm feeling good right now. I'm feeling really good. What Ollie failed to mention was that her cholesterol dropped 58 points and her doctor visits were with Kaiser Physician in, Southern, in, in South Sacramento, by the way, and they were threatening her with cholesterol medicine, so she didn't need to take her cholesterol medicine. She also lost 14 pounds and her acid reflux was gone and she was not taking any of her supplements. So success across a lot of measures. So the shifting belief systems for arterial disease, and Dr. Esselstyn will probably get into this a little bit more detail, it's about the inflammation, the nitrous oxide system, not just the cholesterol, but it's basically nutrition and it's a reversible process. I wanna share one study with you. Uh, John McDougall's always fond of saying, I don't know how many times he says this, but he says, it's the food, you know? Uh, this is a study that was done in southwestern Sudan back in the late 1950s, published in early 1960, and it's about the Maybam tribe. And they'd actually gone to find a tribe in the world that had no noise exposure. This tribe actually you can only get to about three months out of the year when the White Nile is not flooding. Uh, and th they measured their loss of hearing over time, and they found that they didn't lose hearing, very little hearing loss whereas they had a match control in the USA and their hearing was going up. So we have institutionalized aging hearing loss. We actually have a term for it. It's called presbycusis, high frequency loss. Some of you may be experiencing this, okay? But if you, even without the noise exposure, what they found is that's not a natural condition. If you eat right, that won't happen. But for the purpose of today's talk, this is the results that they also tracked on systolic blood pressure. And you can see their systolic blood pressures do not go up whereas the match controls in Wisconsin and the USA goes up. So elevating blood pressure over time is not a normal aging phenomena. It's nutritionally based. They also found, by the way, that they didn't have any chronic disease there. So those of you who are in the audience saying, well, my blood pressure is normal and I don't have diabetes and stuff like that, I want you to think about the fact that this is a continuous variable. And when I went plant-based seven years ago after reading Dr. Campbell's book, which is given to us by a friend, The China Study, uh, my pressures were running about 120 over 85. Now they're about 110 over 65. So I was normal then and I'm normal now, but I'm happier now and I'm at lower risk for problems. So, you know, just because your blood pressure is, quote, normal, I mean, most of you know the medicine people have been changing their treatment parameters uh, for the last few years, redefining things. So. I want you to rethink about what normal means. I don't think it's, there really is such a thing, actually. So we took the learnings from the Meals for Health from Berkeley, and we went to, uh, to Berkeley. Uh, Paul Simpson, who uh, actually attended this conference a couple years ago, had actually grown up, his parents attend the Progressive Church up in uh, Berkeley, and he was the product champion for bringing this program to the church and set this up, and we basically, uh, Church-based, we gave food for three weeks, and then they learned to shop on their own for a week. We used, we did more participants. Instead of 20, we took 31. Uh, we, Mercy was nice enough. Mercy Hospital was nice enough to help us with the lab, but I couldn't even get Kaiser, Mercy, or Sutter to talk to me because they're so paralyzed with the rollout of Obamacare. So we came, we used Life Extension and LabCorp for the lab partner, and I just saw uh, most of them back last month for a four-month follow-up, so we're doing a little longer follow-up. So here again, we learned and we ate and we worked, and this is the big room where we did the kickoff weekend and the rest of the events were over at the church, and here they're packing up all the weekly food boxes. So we had, of the 31 participants, 30 finished the, the one-month program. There were 22 women and eight men, ages 42 to 81. 30 of the 31 had insurance. The weight loss was, in the month was about eight pounds, which is similar to the other program. I reported the two-month results there. Cholesterols were down, blood pressure was down, 60% less medicines, they'd stopped 59 supplements. Some of the exciting, unanticipated, but positive consequences of this program is that they're now talking about changing the menu for their preschool. They have a preschool at the church. They are talking about... They're talking about planting a garden at the church again. 
this coming spring. So it's we've got the ball rolling, and hopefully it's going to keep going. And here again, I can give you numbers, but it's just nice to hear from patients and hear the stories. Remember, stories are a little bit more than information on the levers. So here we go. Here's uh, here's Devana. To anyone who had anything at all to do with this, including our coach, um, who did reach out to me at least a lot, I, I just say thank you. I never thought after I got diagnosed with lupus, which caused me to go into kidney failure, that I would ever feel normal, ever, uh, honestly. Um, waking up tired every day, in pain every day, um, just not having your hair come out, and tw I came out of the hospital with 26 pills a day and a shot that I got gave myself in my belly, and I never thought that my life would be different. My medications would change, but pretty much the fatigue and just feeling so less than myself just kind of remained the same. The very first weekend, um, with the exception of the horrendous gas that I had, <laughs> That very first weekend, that Friday, that Saturday, that Sunday, that Monday morning, I woke up by myself at 5.30. I, was, I woke up without pain, and I noticed it, because when you have lupus, you notice things like that. I sat up in my bed, and Monday is an off day for me. I got a cup of coffee, because Jeff said he would not give us a hard time about the one cup of coffee. So I got the coffee, I went out on the deck outside, and I just sat there and I cried, because I just was like, I cannot believe I just got up by myself, and I wanted to get up, and I don't have any pain. And so it's been like that for me. My energy level is, everybody noticed my energy level, especially my coworkers, because they were like, I don't know if we can handle you going back to the way you were. Um, <laughs> My attention, my focus, I'm off two of my medications and I have secretly tapered down some of my other ones. Um, but Dr. Forrester said to wait for my kidney doctor and my rheumatologist to do the other stuff. But I am just encouraged because I know that I'm gonna come off the, rest, the remainder of that medication. I am, um, without to be graphic, peeing all by myself without the use of some of the medications that I took myself off of. So I just feel very grateful, I mean, and overwhelmed because I really didn't, I knew I would feel better, but I didn't believe I could feel this much better in such a short amount of time. It is just miraculous. So I just thank God, I thank this program. Um, the funding for this, this would, I could not have done this without the assistance of the food, Dr. Forrester. I could, I could not have afforded to do this, so this was just an awesome blessing. What Devana didn't mention is her cholesterol went 58 points down better even after she took off her cholesterol medicine. And she lost five pounds, and her glucose went from about 88 down to 78 and got even better. Uh, remarkable. You may know people who have autoimmune conditions. Uh, there's over a hundred of them. Uh, some of the more common ones, thyroid disease, rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, type 1 diabetes, multiple sclerosis, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, lupus, which you just heard from Devana, and celiac disease. When you start talking about these illnesses, there are some, you get into some sort of nuances that are clinically important, but the common mechanism is exposure to animal proteins, a leaky gut secondary to animal fat, and the endotoxins. Bacteria make endotoxins, which are poisonous to you, and you, when you cook the meat, you actually kill the bacteria. Well, you don't always kill them because one out of four people who are on a standard American diet, one out of four people will have the 24-hour flu, which is basically food poisoning, has about a one in 500 chance of being hospitalized and about a one in 55,000 chance of actually dying from foodborne illness every year. So they don't always kill the bacteria, but even if you kill the bacteria, the endotoxins ride the animal fat into your body. The other thing you need to know about is uh, new 5GC. Uh, we're the only mammal that doesn't make sialic acid. All mammals make sialic acid, and when we eat the muscles, we get sialic acid, and our body metabolizes that to a little molecule called new 5GC. It's not unusual when you take people through this program that within the first week, all their aches and pains go away or get a lot better. And that's probably because the new 5GC has been cleared out of the body. Uh, the other thing that's sort of unique to the autoimmune disorders is after you go on a, on a, on a good plant-based diet, 
you can often have plant foods that are triggers. So sometimes you have to, you know, I've bumped into people at the McDougall Clinic who can't take tomatoes or eggplant or they can't take citrus or something like that. So there's, there's little, there's little tweaks that have to be, but the, but you get the basic message for the autoimmune disorders. So let's wrap it up. Uh, so my individual advice, I can't give you a prescription like a paste doctor because I haven't done a good faith exam, but my advice to you is to eat a non-GMO whole food plant-based diet. Make sure you have adequate vitamin B12 and you maintain fitness. Fitness is aerobic, strength, flexibility, balance, and stability. So here's Dr. Neil Barnard, president for Physicians Committee of Responsible Medicine. Uh, welcome to Sweeney's All You Can Eat Barbecue. I'm Dr. Neil Barnard and I'll be your waiter and cardiologist tonight. So in your search, even if you eat well, you're going to probably contact the medical care industry at some point in your life. And I've got a few words of advice for you if that is to happen uh, as you search for a doctor like myself or Dr. Neil Barnard. This is why it works. Humans are basically have evolved to be herbivores. They're plant eaters. Plant eaters come in two sort of varieties. They're, because plant cells are very thick around the outside as opposed to animal cells, they have to adapt their intestine to be able to get the energy out of it. So we have longer intestines. But we've also adapted either the foregut, like your stomach, or the hindgut, like your colon. Cows have multiple stomachs. They're foregut fermenters. We have adapted our colon, like horses, elephants, and our grade eight relatives, okay? So if anybody asks you why you eat this way, just tell them you're a hindgut fermenting herbivore. <laughs> now, when I was in medical school, they said, well, the colon really didn't do anything but hold on to your poop and absorb water if you needed it. But we now know that your colon digests the fiber in your food. The bacteria actually digest it into two, three, and four carbon molecules. And those two carbon molecules actually fuel your muscles, like carbohydrate loading. The three and four carbon, the propionic and the butyric acid fragments actually get into your body and lower your glucose and lower your cholesterol. So it's sort of like a natural way to improve your numbers. And our anatomy, our whole anatomy, and uh, Dr. Milton Mills, who was one of our speakers at the Berkeley, who did such a great job as a speaker with our Berkeley group, uh, has a whole lecture on how we're uh, set up anatomically to be a gatherer. There's nothing that we're set up to be a hunter. I mean, most of your species that are hunters don't lead with their sexual organs, right? If you notice dogs and cats, their sexual organs are in the back of their body. And they're not designed to stand a long time. If they're not actively moving around hunting, they're, they're resting. We can stand for long periods of time. Support's important. Here's how things can change over time. Uh, here you've got the skinny kids making fun of the fat kids back in 1965 when I was trying to get out of high school. And now in 2005, the fat kids are making fun of the skinny kids. So things have changed. But it's important to have support from family, friends, and, and various organizations. So when you contact with the medical care industry, be, be easy on your doc. Here's a lady who says, I can't tell you how glad I am to have finally found a doctor who doesn't harp on me about my weight. <laughs> 700,000 pieces of literature hit the medical library every year that are new. Just in adult medicine, just on the tertiary side of treatment, I'd have to read 40 articles a day every day for a whole year to keep up. Dr. Michael Greger, who is the author of a fabulous resource called nutritionfacts.org, for those of you who don't know it, I would start looking into it. He reads all the scientific human-based literature every year. And he puts up uh, a website where you can actually see the articles and the abstracts for free, but he reads 12,000 articles. So I follow around people like John McDougall, who reads all the medical literature, and Michael Greger, who reads all the scientific literature, and just come through that sort of stuff. So you, there's so much stuff out there, it's not the doctor's fault. They're also not trained. They're supposed to be trained in quality management, but the residency programs don't do a good job, and the organizations they don't j join don't do a j good job, except for like Intermountain Healthcare that does a great job. And they don't know how to interact with end systems, complex systems. They do go out after technology in a big way, but we don't evaluate it very well. So here's a guy. Yes, stomach stapling is quite expensive, but if you prefer a cheaper alternative, I could staple your mouth shut for five bucks. <laughs> Actually, I like that approach better because, you know, when you reroute all your good plumbing, that's probably not a very good idea. Uh, preventive medicine does kill return business, however. 
but the medical profession has sidestepped that by introducing screening and telling you that's primary prevention, when in most of the case, the Frame and Carlson guidelines back in the 70s show that there are some six criteria you have to meet before you actually screen for diseases. And if you apply those criteria to most of the screening recommendations from most medical organizations of the government these days, it fails. Some of the women in this room may occasionally get hounded to get mammography. I would strongly encourage you to go to the May uh, 2012 uh, McDougall newsletter. I think it's May. It could be July. It's in that area somewhere where he, he actually posted the Cochrane mammogram screening leaflet, which is an 18-page screening leaflet on screening a general population. I'm not talking about a diagnostic mammogram. If I feel a lump on a breast, I'm going to send, send a patient for a mammogram. I'm talking about general screening. Very interesting. And for those of you who want to drill down even farther, uh, Dr. Gotzi wrote a book where he went through all the studies, the flaws and the pluses, and tells you what the studies show. But at my particular point, I can't really recommend mammography for any women at any age. Okay. But you know, to understand that, you've got to look at those, those pieces of information. Uh, Medicine has become very complex and involves teamwork, medicine, nursing, pharmacy, all the allied healthcare professionals. All I can tell you is if you can start eating correctly, you will have less medications and less need for us, and it will make our jobs easier when you come in to see me because they will be on less medications. It'll be a lot better for all of us. So let's hear from Kimberly. I was healthy on paper, and I thought, you know, I was living my life, but I wasn't. I thought I knew how to eat healthy. I've had the same doctor my entire adult life. I've been a member of Kaiser since 1976. I knew what it was to eat healthy. Oh, eat this, don't eat that, eat this, don't eat that, cut your calories, da 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 It didn't work. I had IBS every day, multiple times a day for, God, don't want to cry again, um, for my daughter's entire life. Three days after changing what I eat, I've not had IBS. And that's been almost three months now. I don't have migraines anymore. I have fibromyalgia, but I'm almost not going to claim that anymore because I feel so much healthier. I have so much more energy. I just am so excited. Um, I've lost over 40 pounds in two and a half months. I thought that uh, I knew what it was to be healthy. I thought I was stuck in the life that I had having fibromyalgia and just existing. I am so grateful to everyone here that started this program because I, can, I have a life now. I can live and enjoy my life and spend time with my kids and not just sleep all day long. And I never would have been able to experience any of that if it wasn't for Earth Save and Most for Health. Kimberly's uh, cholesterol went down 50 points, over 50 points. Her blood pressure went down. Uh, her restless legs diagnosis vanished. Uh, unfortunately, she was in a car accident a couple months later and had to deal with some whiplash issues. Now she's better, but uh, she got better faster because she was eating correctly. Uh, the reason I sort of close with the clip on obesity is because people, when they saw me at Kaiser Permanente, were encouraged as a primary cash prepare a physician to bring in their list of things. And somewhere on a lot of people's list was I want to lose a few pounds. So since I'm trying to give you advice that will be useful for you, not that you may need to lose a few pounds, but in case you do or you know people who does, the shifting beliefs that you need to know, and here's uh, the fat pigeon being talked to by the skinny pigeon, uh, you've got to start eating out of a different parking lot. <laughs> It's the environment. You can take wild rats and put them in a cage with wild rat food and no exercise wheel, and they don't get fat. You put them in there with an exercise wheel and McDonald's, they get, they get fat. There are only three species on the planet that have obesity. I mean, there's no, there's no advantage to having being obese. If you're a predator, you can't catch anything, and if you're prey, you're going to get caught and eaten. All well, the people that catch you and eat you might appreciate you being a little bit fat. Uh, so cats, dogs, and humans. And the reason the cats and dogs are fatter because they're around us. So the key concepts around obesity are calorie density. For those of you who are interested in this, uh, they're selling Jeff Novick's calorie density, eat more, weigh less, and live longer DVD out at the desk. It's the best thing you've ever seen. The nice thing about what Jeff did was he actually wetted exercise 
to calorie density. Uh, we got to talk a little bit about addiction, but the only diet that works is the ad libitum diet. And I've been, you know, I was in practice for 30 years with Kaiser. I've seen just about every diet. They seem to be really creative about what they come up with. You know, about the time you think they've run out of things they could possibly do and you're waiting for the grapefruit diet to come back, they come up with some other amazing thing. So here's the last, here's this cartoon. Uh, <laughs> Say what you will about eating children, it does adhere to the Adkins diet. <laughs> diets usually were either low calorie diets or calorie restricted, which means, uh, but your body's hardwired not to have that. So that your leptin level, which is a hormone, goes down, that decreases your metabolism, increases your appetite. Those, those diets don't work over time. The high protein diets make you physically ill because the protein load on your body affects your stomach. The only diet that works is the ad libitum diet. Great study that was done in Hawaii. They took a group of about 30 Hawaiians and put them on the standard Hawaiian diet. Ate all they want. Standard American diet, they were eating 2,700 calories a day. They ate all they want of a sweet potato taro-based diet, and that had gone down to 1,600 calories a day. You can imagine how much weight they lost in three weeks, just eating till fullness because they were eating the right food in the right environment. So let's talk briefly about beliefs and then we'll wrap it up. So if you think that a food like milk does the body good, you're gonna go into the store and you're gonna get milk, right? Or got milk as they say on this ad. But here's a gentleman who didn't pay attention to one of his support systems. His wife warned him about the hormones and all that meat and dairy you eat. It's like my wife says, you know, it's not our fault. We get, don't ask directions when we get lost. We're missing the second leg off our second X chromosome, right? What can I say? Um, so if you think a food is good for you, you're liable to buy it. If you're not sure it's good for you, but you like its taste, you might buy it. But if you find out that, like Dr. Campbell did in his research, that casein, which is the main protein in milk, actually is initiator or promoter of growth of cancer cells, maybe you think it's harmful. Or you find out that if my son, son and daughter-in-law give my six-year-old granddaughter two glasses of cow's milk, that she now has three times the estrogen that her normal body makes. Because, you know, they've got new and improved dairy cows these days. They keep them pregnant while they're nursing them, so they've got a lot of natural estrogen in them. And then we got all these guys running around drinking milk as uh, recovery drinks. And, and you give a guy two glasses of milk, his testosterone level goes down 20%, and his female hormone goes up 25% in the next one to two hours. So it may be harmful for us. But then you find that casein is broken down into eight different casomorphins in the gut, which are morphine-like compounds that are absorbed into the body. So people are actually addicted to dairy. 20% of cheese consumers in this country eat dairy straight out of the package. 20% put cheese on everything. This is biochemical addiction. It has nothing to do with weak will. And then you find that dioxin, which is the most carcinogenic substance known to man or woman, your FDA recommended safe levels, 130 femtograms per day. That's a quadrillionth of a gram. 130, right? 49,000 in one scoop of a high-quality ice cream. 95,000 in one single pizza piece from some of the more common chains that uses a lot of cheese. The half-life of that stuff in, your hu in the body is about seven years. So I've been plant-based for seven years. I've about got rid of half my dioxin load. So key point for today, proper nutrition minimizes chronic disease and disability. That's the key point. So going back to this, for those of you who remember this slide, you may have looked at the number three spot on there and caught that. It's actually medical care. Okay, this comes out of the Institute of Medicine reports in 1999 and 2001. And actually, when I spoke here two years ago, had the had the privilege of doing that. I made a case in my talk, Tragedy of the Health Commons, that I move medical care to the leading cause of death in the country because I held medical care responsible for not doing some of the things Dr. Esselstyn, Dr. Campbell, and the rest of us are trying to get people to do. So, how hazardous is medical care? Well, we've got a star in the, org in, in, in the industry, actually. It's anesthesia. They put you to sleep. It's very safe. It's considered a very safe, uh, very safe uh, process. The rest of healthcare, though, is somewhere up around bungee jumping and mountain climbing, okay? So by keeping, you can avoid the third leading cause of death by reversing chronic disease and preventing it, Avoiding disability, less contact with us, less chance we're going to do you in or have a complication. So a special thanks to Sabrina and Jeff Nelson. 
Mary and John McDougall, all the sponsors and donors who made the Meals for Health possible, the volunteers who labor in the background and never get the glitzy exposure and stuff like that, and more specifically, the participants who took the leap and were brave enough to undergo something that they were a little concerned about, and specifically the participants who allow people like Jeff and myself to share their stories to hopefully help you avoid chronic disease and prevent disability and live a quality life. So I hope tonight, tonight, today you've had a chance to pick up some things that will help you in your journey. I thank you for your time and have a good weekend.